Hello everybody, free is the magic number. Free, we all want to be free and free of all that's going on in the connection to this universe. We want to be part of it, not struck down to all the mechanical laws that this planet's putting upon us. And I've been talking a lot about Triomazi Kamno, the law of free, Gurdjieff's law of free. So I'm going to start with a quote from J.G. Bennett in his book, Transformation, which I've been rereading and recommend everyone to get if you can. With Gurdjieff, the three elements of communication, speech, language and meaning were always integrated into one whole. This was achieved by applying the principle of threefoldness, developed in all his writings, but especially in the chapter Purgatory. I'm pretty sure I've put a recording of Purgatory on this YouTube channel. If not, it's definitely on the Internet Archive as an audio download if you don't have the book. Continuing. The anno beginning or false place or masculine element was always the intention from which meaning derives. The cafo beginning or false minus was language. Language for Gurdjieff was passive, the feminine element in discourse. Speech or the medium of communication was the reconciling principle or neutralizing force. This is one reason why it is important to hear Gurdjieff's writings read aloud. It was his own being which inspired his speech with the power to penetrate below the surface of our personality. In his written word, he sets himself to achieve an equal penetration. So when we're reading Gurdjieff's writings, that law of three, that, that Bennett's describing there should be penetrating into us to work on us, but we may still need to make the effort. Effort's one of the parts of the law of free, you know, putting the effort in to understand what this law of free is that's going on around us. And C.S. Knott writes here, will individuality consciousness of the free forces in the absolute? as according to the law of the octave, that the forces that flow down the ray of creation that are involving become more and more mechanical, so forces become changed. Will becomes inertia, resistance, obstinacy. Consciousness is regarded as perceptivity, individuality is a personality, a thing. And what we're saying here, or what not saying here, is our planet's one of the furthest away from the sun absolute, and as I said in a previous show, every planet and solar system, sun, etc., has a certain amount of laws to it. And the further away they come from the sun absolute and where the divine source lives, the more mechanical laws are put onto our planet and onto us. And we're striving to get out of them. We can get away from it, still be on planet Earth, but have less laws affecting us by becoming more harmonious within ourselves, aligning our free centers and being in touch with our higher selves. So the forces are coming in, they're involving to us to work on us, then we need to work on them so they evolve back out up to the absolute. And if we don't work on them, we send back not very good evolutionary vibes. But it's not just back to the sun absolute, it's also down into the planet Earth, because the Earth is evolving as well and developing to become a sun at some point. And so all them intentions, vibrations we're creating are going back into the earth to help it develop. And this is why I think many people argue with me about this. It's not all definite. It's not all fated. The earth could go wrong. It might not develop into a sun. It might degrade and become, I don't know, like maybe that's why Mars failed, as I've said before in other shows. Maybe Mars didn't work out, and that's why it's turned into a dead planet, if it is a dead planet, none of us really know. But um, us working on ourselves, putting the vibrations out there back to the sun absolute, into its endlessness, and down into the earth is all good work. And by doing that, we have to be part of the laws of free. So we're going to go to meetings with remarkable men, Gurdjieff says. To obtain any definite new substance, its constituent parts must be combined in exact quantitative proportions. Most simple example, to bake bread, to make dough, you must take definite proportions of flour and water. Too little water it will crumble at the first touch. Too much, you get a mash. 
And I've said before, there's a difference between quantity and quality, but quantity obviously does become important in some respects, in certain creations it's needed, like he's just explained here. With, when you're making bread, you need a certain amount of each ingredient. And the better the quality, the better the bread. But the right quantity makes the bread work. And it's the same with the law. Of, this is the law of free working. You know, we need the law of free to be happening in the right quantity and quality to make it run harmoniously. So we're going to go to all and everything. Let me find the book, page 138. The second fundamental cosmic law, the sacred triomasi camno, consists of three independent forces. And this sacred law manifests in everything without exception and everywhere in the universe in three separate independent aspects. So it's, this law happens in everything, absolutely everything. Continuing. The holy affirming, the holy denying, the holy reconciling. A law which always flows into a consequence, it becomes the cause of subsequent consequences and always functions by free, independent and quite opposite and characteristic manifestations latent within it. Within it, properties neither seen nor sensed. So sometimes we don't realise what all these ingredients are for the law of free to work which is why we need to understand how the cosmos works. We need to understand how everything works. And it's something that the book All and Everything does explain. And you yourself will hopefully be doing studies of things and seeing how certain things make other things happen, cause and effects and all that. And we've got the cause, we've got the effects. And from that is the outcome of what's going on or the action of the cause and the effects bring together. So All and Everything, page 589. The common presence of the planetary body of every being and in general of any other relatively independent great or small cosmic unit must consist of all the free localized sacred substances or forces of the holy triomasi camno, of the substance forces of the holy affirming, holy denying and holy reconciling, and it must be sustained by them all the time in a corresponding and balanced state. So we're back to the balance. Balance is really important with this kind of thing. Um, I've said before about the scowls. Maurice Nicole writes about this in his books. You've got your scowls, negative, positive, going up and down. And we want to get the balance of the two so they come together. And we, we want to make that balance of that scowl going up and down. And once it's balanced, we're harmonized. Neither, neither, as Austin Osman Spare, the great British magician, would say, neither, neither. It's neither, yes, neither, no. So, all in everything, page 751. The second primordial fundamental cosmic law, the sacred triomasi camno, common cosmic objective science, also formulates with the words, a new arising from the previously arisen through the Arnul Myasnal, the process of which is actualized thus. The higher blends with the lower in order to actualize the middle, and thus becomes higher for the preceding lower, or lower for the succeeding higher. This sacred triomasi camno consists of three independent forces. The first, the affirming force or the pushing force, or simply the force plus. The second, the denying force or the resisting force, or simply the force minus. And the third, the reconciling force or the equal equilibrating force or the neutralizing force. So again, back to them scales, you've got the, the um, affirming, the denying, and the neutralizing brings it all together. We're trying to bring balance to our, our world, to our universe, to ourselves, to everything that's going on for ourselves. Balance is the important key. And continuing on to the next page of All and Everything, 752. The free brain beings of that planet began at that period when the consequences of the organ Kunda buffer were not yet crystallized in their presences. To be aware of these free holy forces of the sacred triumph as he can know and name them, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost. And in various cases expressed the hidden meaning of them and also their longing to have a beneficent effect from them for their own individuality by the following prayers. So let's all pray together. 
sources of divine rejoicings, revolts and sufferings direct your actions upon us. Holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling, transubstantiating me for my being. Holy God, holy firm, holy immortal, have mercy on us. Have mercy on our souls. It's our souls we want to develop. An important prayer, maybe start using that one if you can remember it. <laughs> so again, it's bringing these three forces in and it's an esoteric law in a way. It's been hidden in all the esoteric teachings, but it's also been out there as, as like with the occult, it says it's all hidden in plain sight. We have the law of free and everything. And you know, whatever your religion is, whatever faith you're following, there is a law of free in there. Okay, in Christianity, we've got God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You know, in Hinduism, we've got um, let me get this right. Shiva, Kali, Durga, maybe. Anyway, you'll find your free in the Egyptians. We've got Isis and Osiris and Horus and so on, and so on, and so on. So find your free and start working with them. They're all the same, the same laws. They've all got the same underlying uh, meaning to them, bringing together the free. So that we get balance. So I'm gonna do views from the real world. I've said this, this next quote quite a few times, but I think it's an important one. It is not enough to understand with mind, it is necessary to feel with your being the absolute truth and the inevitability of the unity of the laws governing the universe and the overall unity of all that exists. The inevitable conclusion of all that he said was the great law of tri-unity, the law of the three principles of action, resistance and equipoise. Now resting on the solid foundations of the earth and armed with this law, he applied it with a bold flight of thought to the whole solar system. So try unity, T-R-I, hyphen unity. The free brings together everything into a unity, into a, a union. And continuing with views from the real world. Work will be of value only when again. Oh, let me in. <laughs> work will be of value only when a man gives as much as is the limit of possibility. Normally in man's work, the participation of feeling and thought is necessary. If one of these functions is absent, the quality of the man's work will be on the level of one who works with two brains. We want to be free brained. Remember that. Working like a man means that a man feels what he is doing and thinks why and for what he is doing it, how he is doing it, how he had to be, it had to be done yesterday, how today and how he would have to do it tomorrow, whether there is a better way. If a man works rightly, he would succeed in doing better and better work. But when a two brain creature works, there is no difference between its work yesterday, today and tomorrow. You know, that's just doing the same thing over and over without any effort into it, where we're trying to improve it so that tomorrow is a better day. And I know we have the uh, terror of tomorrow. Tomorrow may never come, which is why we must work hard today. We must do the work today and improve each and every day. We're getting better and better and better as the adage goes. Right, hold on, I've got to go to a different book. Oh no, back to views from the real world, page 188. This law, the law of the Trinity, is everywhere. There could be no new thing without the third force. The law is above, so below is the same everywhere. It is all one law. We also have in us the sun, the moon, and the planets, only on a very small scale. Remember, you are the universe. <laughs> The same law goes through everything, the law of free, positive, negative, neutralizing. When the first two forces are linked with a third, something quite different is created. So when the positive and the negative come together and work together, then the neutralizing starts happening and making the magic happen. Example, flower, water, fire, unity consists of three matters. In religion, we have a prayer, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost, free in one, expressing the law rather than a fact. This fundamental unity is used in physics and taken as the standard of unity. The three matters are carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen, and together they make the hydrogen, which is the foundation of all matter, whatever its density. So hydrogen, 
Gurdjieff talks a lot about the hydrogens and the different uh, states of hydrogen as they go through the planets, the solar system and the universe and in us and the food that we eat and all the different hydrogens. You can find a lot of this kind of information in Spensky's books. He does all tables of hydrogens and such like. I really need to learn how to share screen. I think I know how to do it and show you all these. But you can get the books and look them up and you can even look up on the internet that people have put up these. So continuing, views from the real world. If you look with three centers, you cannot be under hallucination at all. You must begin by collecting material. You can have no bread without baking. Knowledge is water, body is flour, and emotion, suffering is fire. So once we start putting the law of free into everything, we start, you know, being waking up. You know, it's no longer the hallucination, the vow that is drawn down upon us all so that we can't see what's really going on. Understanding the law of free helps to lift that vow so we can see that life is real only when I am or when you are or whatever. Life is real when we understand. And I know people seek for knowledge, but to have that knowledge, looking at it from the law of free, we also need the wisdom to come with it to create an understanding. You know, lots of people can be smarty pants and know everything, but do they know how to make use of that knowledge and how to use it wisely? And do they really understand what it is that they, they know? This is all part of doing this work. Combinations of positive and negative principles can produce new results, different from the first and second, only if a third force comes in. If I affirm, she denies, and we argue. But nothing new is created until something else is added to the discussion. Then something new arises. So we can put this law of free into everyday life. And if we're doing the same patterns over and over again, then we need something to come in and change it. We need a new, another force to move it on and make us go to the next stage or go up or down. We want to go up, really. The law, uh, view from the real world, page 208. The law of free is found everywhere and in everything, also in conversation. One person affirms, another denies. If they argue, a new result is produced. A new conception, unlike that of the man who affirmed or that of the man who denied. Your former conversations, there has been a result, but not for you, for something or someone outside you. But now we speak of results in us or of those we wish to have in us. So instead of this law acting through us, outside us, we wish to bring it within ourselves, for ourselves. And in order to achieve this, we have merely to change the field of action in this law. What you have done so far when you affirmed, denied and argued with others, I want you to do now with yourselves so that the results you may not, that you get may not be objective as they've been so far, but subjective. <laughs> so we're trying to, become aware of what's going on in our lives when we're doing things when we're, you know, for example, where he uses the example of arguing with someone, be aware of what it is you're arguing about and seeing whether you can see the change of what's coming out from all this. And I know we're supposed to be working objectively, but here he's talking about working subjectively because we need to work on ourselves so that we can then learn the laws, learn the cosmology, and then go forward and start working objectively for the suffering of his endlessness, as he talks about, to help, to help um, lighten the suffering of his endlessness. Instead, we want to send good vibes and things. But, you know, you need to read all this to find out more. As I said in, in an earlier quote, you read the books and the words start penetrating into you. You hear the Beelzebub's towers being read to you, and if you're listening intensely and properly, you will start feeling and understanding what it is he's telling us. And it will start working on you. It starts going deeper into you, into your subconscious. And then your subconscious comes up and has a different word with your conscious. So we're going to go to In Search of the Miraculous. And find, I've got the wrong book. Hold on.
Right, so in search of the miraculous, Spensky starts getting quite scientific about it all. And I'd highly recommend a really big quote. Well, it's over a page. I'm not going to do it now, but page 77 to 78 of In Search of the Miraculous talks all about the fundamental laws. And then on page 89, he says, besides ordinary chemistry, there exists a special chemistry or alchemy which studies matter, taking into account its cosmic properties, determined by its place, by the force which is acting through it at the given moment. Each substance can be the conductor of any one of the three forces and can be active, passive or neutralizing. And it can be none if no force is manifesting through it at the given moment. In one case, all the functions are controlled by the physical body. It is active in relation to it, everything else is passive. In another case, the second body, and he's talking about the astral here, has power over the physical. In the third case, the mental body has power over the astral and the physical. In the last case, the fourth body, the causal or the divine, which is like your eye, has power over the first three. In man of physical body, only the physical functions may control feeling, thought, and consciousness. But we're trying to be a harmonized person so that we've got all three uh, lines, so we can get in contact with them higher centers and feel what they're sending down to us, which is all good vibrations, <laughs> so that we can be part of working with the law of free rather than it against us or deceiving us, or maybe deceiving is the wrong word. When we don't understand what it's doing, we don't get its benefits. This is a, a strange quote, maybe, to get some people thinking. So this is in Search of the Miraculous, page 266. I understood the esoteric principle of the impossibility of violence, that is, the uselessness of violent means to attain no matter what. Violent means and methods in anything whatever would unfailingly produce negative results, that is to say, results opposed to those aims for which they were applied. And I think about this quote a lot because, you know, I get caught up with violent thoughts, violent emotions in myself of when things aren't working out for me. And I have to look at why is it? What is it in these laws that isn't that I'm not paying attention to or heeding? Why am I going against it? Is it some kind of mechanical programming in me that's stopping me taking a step back and looking at why I want to be give a violent outburst, whether it's in my head, mouth, body. <laughs> I'm not saying I go around smacking people or anything, but the law of free helps us work out the results that come in us, the why we why we act like this. As I was saying earlier. One of the quotes you were saying about thinking about what you're doing or what's happening, the hows, the whys, the whats, the whens. <laughs> when you start applying them to these laws, it starts to make more sense. And in the In Search of the Miraculous, Aspensky talks obviously a lot about the Enneagram. And helping to understand that and if we can get a full understanding of the enneagram apparently we will know everything <laughs> but the enneagram helps us to understand that law of free the triangle in the enneagram is that law of free we've got the triangle and then we've got one four two eight five seven i'm probably doing that back to one doing that backwards to you on this anyway go and have a look at an enneagram it's a great thing to just to meditate on anyway So I'm going to go back to Knott now. Knott says, in speaking of the denying force, Gurdjieff sometimes used the word dabble, meaning devil. You wish to be an angel, but dabble is also necessary. Angel can do one thing, dabble can do another. All right, okay, I forgot. I was going to do this from in search, from a Spensky. Spensky says, this is from the, I think this is from the fourth way, I haven't written down which one it is, or it could be a record of meetings. There are six activities possible for man, seventh only possible for absolute, in all other worlds only six are possible. And he uses these numbers in different combinations, so we've got one, two, three, one, three, two, two, one, three, three, one, two, three, two, one, two, three, one. 
first character category, number one, trying to remember yourself, esoteric work, also best forms of art, poetry, perhaps music. Two, highest intellectual inventions, discoveries. Three, professional work, tailors, doctors, always means effort or sacrifice. Four, simply physical work, sawing wood. Five, destruction works by itself, violent actions such as burning a house. And six is crime. So he's putting all these <laughs> six ways into different combinations for us to work, you know, to make us notice how we use these to work on ourselves or what we're turning into, whether we're like any of them six. There's probably many more. And seeing the Lord free, they always seem to work in freeze, these kind of activities. So you have to find the activity that you want to be or don't want to be and make sure you're not misusing your life, your ways, your efforts to go down a wrong path and instead get into a more harmonious law of the free so that you're developing yourself and going down the right path and not using violence or you know just thinking of everything intellectually instead of adding some emotion to it and things. Again, it's the law of free bringing it all together. It's kind of a hard thing for me to explain. I'm not doing a very good job of it here. But um, read Espensky, read Glergia, and they explain it a lot more in a way that, as he says, his words will penetrate into you. But going back to not. Objectively, any lessening of the strength of yes in relationship to no or vice versa results in psychopath psychopathy. They must be equalized and from this equalization feeling is obtained. We have three centers, all of which must be functioning in the same way. And a big yes against a big no produces a big feeling when all three centers are working at their fullest vibrations and in harmony. <laughs> so it's back to that neither, neither. We've got your balancing scales, yes and no. We want to balance it out. So their level. And not says, the father is made of none, neither created nor begotten. The son is of the father alone and not made, not created, but begotten. The Holy Ghost is of the father and of the son, neither made nor created nor begotten, but proceeding. And in the Trinity, none is a for or after our other. None is greater or less than another. But the whole three persons are co-eternal together and co-equal, says the Athanasian Creed, which is quite interesting. I, I don't know if you know about the Nicene Council, where they try to discuss what Jesus or Christ really is. Was he man that became Christ that God entered into? Was he born God and just put on a human body? Them kinds of things are quite interesting to ponder on. And the same with with quite a few other gods really I suppose but with Christ because he's um <laughs> we have the gospels and the new testament to read into it's quite interesting the meanings when you look deeper into them the esoteric meanings not just the exoteric you know the mundane mundane one word to say but the stories and parables for the everyday people and then when we read them from an esoteric point of view we start looking into the deeper meaning of them again this is all part of the laws of you know, how developed you are as to whether you can see the true understanding, the esoteric meaning to what's really going on. But is it important whether we know whether Christ was born a man who became God when the Holy Spirit descended onto him, when John the Baptist baptised him? Or was he God all along? Is it important? I'm not sure. I like to think about them kind of things. But I still think we can attain to find the Christ in us and develop ourselves and become Christ and walk through. I am the Christ. Just try not to be crucified. So Not says it is sometimes said in modern physics that we are the products of, products of electricity. The three forces are assembled in one. Okidanok, electricity, positive, negative and neutralizing. Nokidarnok is one of the words that Gurdjieff's using, made up for um, Beelzebub's towels to try and e to express what he really means. 
So we need to go and read Beelzebub's Towers and understand what Okidanok's all about. So Okidanok, electricity, positive, negative, and neutralizing. Gurdjieff says that two previous civilizations have gone down because of too much mechanical use of electricity. Ours may be the third. Owing to this extreme mechanical use, there is less for psychological use. Hence the will-lessness, the aimlessness of people. And Gurdjieff says somewhere, and I'm still trying to find where he said that, that the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, had a better understanding of how to use electricity to be live in a more harmonized way. And that's why they were more um, aware of their uh, meanings for being here and what goes on with life after death and such thing. And if you do like Egyptology and you go and look at all the ancient books or the ancient scriptures and the ancient uh, statues, it's quite interesting to see how some of them are in a special box so they're in a box, normally stood on a little platform, and then there's the god or the person that's that that, that uh, steel lies about in there, as if they're in a Faraday cage. So did they have a better understanding of what electricity is for us to use for ourselves, rather than all this, like what is said in this quote by not about how we use electricity now just to help run our everyday mechanical lives when we should be using it instead for our development and our spiritual and soulful development of going on to the next stage, or perhaps even to help with this planet. Maybe the way they did it, you know, in whatever it was they were doing was in this electrical, if it was an electrical cage, but do go and look them up. These pictures of, so they're in a, like a box with a kind of half arc, standing on a little box. And normally they're holding what they call the wadget, the, long stick with a, a set, the Egyptian god sets a symbol on the top of it. And it's interesting that they don't normally have it touching the ground. So there is books about this, not many, but some people look into this and wonder if all this symbolism shows when they're being electrified in a harmonious way to help them with their development, not being electrocuted is when they, they're holding these stick up and when it's down on the ground it's when they're grounding themselves you can see uh usually ladies outside the faraday box i'm calling it the faraday box but who knows what it's called like normally a golden box it is that they're in offering them something whether it's some kind of perfume or whatever is what they not the historians say but maybe it's something to help with this electrical development or use of electricity should perhaps do a show on that anyway that's me thinking to myself there but if you you know you can google and look up or whatever you use for a internet drive look at these pictures and have a little think maybe about what it is they're doing you know maybe most egyptologists say they're just being worshipped they're being praised but there's something else going on and it's interesting that all these boxes in the museums and that that they have like for example the Tutankhamun collection and many others, these big boxes they stood in are gold, which is a conductor of electricity. Something's going on there, and Gurdjieff knew, but I need to find out more about that. So, not says, primordial substance is one, but one is free. Affirming, denying, reconciling, or positive, negative, neutralizing. Can you differentiate these three? And that's what we're working on trying to do. Araj said to Knott, after birth, according to Gurdjieff, we repeat the history of the planet. Two centers are split off, objective conscience sinks, deserts appear, emotional deserts. The mental center, which should be active, father, no longer seeks out the instinctive center, which should be passive, mother. And so instead of producing a reconciling result represented by a child, the emotional center, the mental center becomes, as it were, homosexual, titillation in place of breeding, words and words, mental masturbation. YouTube doesn't mind me saying that. 
I know somewhere I put up on the Internet Archive or Raji's book all about what he said when he was working with Gurdjieff and what the Gurdjieff work is all about. You can find that in the audio section of Internet Archive. It's all written out in Knott's book. I think it's book number one. He reproduces the little booklet that Oraj wrote about the Gurdjieff work. You know, Oraj had a fantastic, profound understanding of the Gurdjieff work. And I'm just going to do a quick quote from Margaret Anderson. Every situation in the world is like a problem in mathematics as a positive and negative and neutralizing force, active, passive, neutralizing. The neutralizing force is the form giving force. And Gurdjieff says in this book about questions that were about him, Gurdjieff says, you say there are two different times for you as there are two states, the ordinary state, the habitual state in life and the state of self remembering. There are two times that in which you have the habit of understanding, perceiving everything, that of six Rue de Cornel's Renard, which is where he was living, the flat where people used to come for the talks. From now on, when you are afraid of losing your time, measure time by your state. This time has a key, I am. With the head, you say I am. At the same time, you must have this sensation in your whole presence, in all your gestures, and all at once there will be a change. Cosmic time will inevitably flow as you will have need of it. You are you. Even cosmic laws submit to a unity, even if it is very small. Two times a difference. This will help you to hurry up to do what you have not done in the past. I advise you to take every necessary measure to live according to the time of I am in the state of I am. Not only theoretically when you remember it, but in being more concentrated with your whole presence. Think that there are two times, the time of work and the time of the ordinary man. And so with the law of three, I wish you all well, holy affirming, holy denying, holy reconciling, transubstantiating me from my being. Thank you for listening. Three is the magic number.